This episode is brought to you by La Quinta by Wyndham. Wherever your work takes you, you know it's going to be a good time because you're staying at La Quinta by Wyndham. They have free breakfast, fully equipped gyms, and free high-speed Wi-Fi to help you take care of any last-minute business or help keep you in the know on all things sports. Tonight, La Quinta. Tomorrow, you triumph. Book your stay today at LQ.com. This episode is brought to you by Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, now playing only in theaters. In this franchise's final installment, the most iconic adventurer of all time comes out of retirement to search for a legendary device with the power to change history. Harrison Ford returns alongside Phoebe Waller-Bridge and Mads Mikkelsen. Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, now playing only in theaters. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Welcome back to Tennis Unfiltered with me, James Gray of iNews.co.uk and the iNewspaper. I've got something a little bit different for you today in more ways than one. First of all, I'm only going to talk about eight tennis matches because there were only eight on the second day of Wimbledon as all play on the outside courts bar the first hour uh, was wiped out. Ground passes, number two and number three court were all given full refunds because there was, well, on average... Less than an hour's play on the outside courts. Uh, Fortunately, we do have two roofs at Wimbledon, and so we were able to get some tennis on. First of all, I should point out that centre court starts at 1.30pm and number one starts at 1pm. And despite the awful forecast, despite the fact that we are now miles behind in the tennis, Wimbledon will not relent in that being the start time for the tennis. It's infuriating... It's classic inflexibility. Surely they've looked at this and thought, maybe we can get an extra match on. And maybe give, you know, centre court ticket holders a little bit more bang for their buck. Which, let's face it, they spend a lot of buck. But, no, we waited. (laughs) There, There was a point, well, there was about an hour, when we had two courts covered from the rain and no tennis going on. Um... If that's not ludicrousness, I don't really know what is. But uh, there you go. That's sometimes just life. Um, In a few moments, we're going to hear from Danny Rogers, who is a very esteemed journalist and, uh, well, his colleague. He's an occasional columnist for The Eye. He's also a listener. I'd like to say hello, Danny. And he's also a brand expert because of his background, which you'll hear a bit more about uh, in a few moments. He is someone who knows the ins and outs of Wimbledon extremely well. He has a lot of very good contacts there. um, And he knows the world of branding and marketing and advertising very well indeed. And on the back of a listener question, I thought I'd track down someone who knows more about it than me, which is, I suppose, what a good journalist should do. And Danny was kind enough to give us 15 or 20 minutes of his time. So you'll hear that in a moment. But this is a Grand Slam Daily podcast, and therefore I should talk about what went on in the Daily Grand Slam, the Grand Slam you know what I mean. Um, and namely, we had Elena Rabakina opening centre court, as the defending champion always does on Tuesday, the female defending champion specifically. Um, and she, I mean, she was nervous. There's no two ways about it. Um, she double faulted the very first point of the match. She was broken in that very first service game. As people know, I went and watched her practice against Sabalenka last week and she looked awful. Um, She looked ill, she looked like she wasn't fully fit and I was really worried about exactly which Elena Rabakina might come out. She admitted afterwards that, you know, she hadn't done as much work as she'd like to and she did feel undercooked. She wouldn't use that phrase, (laughs) as anyone who's heard her speak knows. It's not the kind of idiomatic English she's likely to use, but... She did say that she she thought she would get back better, more likely to win every match with every match that she played, which um, is, I guess, how a lot of players feel. Um, but particularly her, because she has come in a little bit light of practice. Um, and I think it showed, you know, she lost that first set. Uh, we were all scrambling for the last time a defending champion went out in the first round. In the men's, I believe it was Leighton Hewitt, 
in the women's. It's only ever happened once before in the Open Era, uh, and it was Steffi Graf back in 1994. She was stunned in the first round. Uh, so we were all sort of setting up for that story, and then Elena were back, and I found her serve. She found her confidence. She found her game. She hit 12 aces in the match overall. Her serve did really carry her through it. She won the next two sets for the loss of just three games, and in just over an hour, those uh, next two sets, having lost the first one in 45 minutes, and she, yeah, really pulled it and turned it around. Uh, she joked afterwards that maybe the reason she was so nervous was because Roger Federer was watching. Yes, Roger Federer back at Wimbledon today, sitting in the Royal Box alongside um, someone I recently called in the tweet, Kate Middleton, and was uh, given lots of abuse for not calling her the Princess of Wales, Duchess of Cambridge, Baroness Carrick Fergus, and all of her other titles. Um, but if I end up on a royal digression again, then it's going to take rather a long time to get off it, as people who listen to what shall always now be known as the Royal Podcast will remember. Anyway, she's through. That's the most important thing for Elena Rabakina fans and for Elena Rabakina herself, of course, and all of Kazakhstan. Uh, I'm sure she is through to the second round, which can only be said for uh, two other women in the bottom half of the draw, so... She will have an advantage there. She could play, incidentally, Elise Corne in the next round. The, someone I described in copy today is the giant killer. And I mean that because Elise Corne loves the opportunity to come in as the underdog and spoil the party. She's a great competitor. She's quite good on the grass. She's got to beat now Habino of um, Japan, the lucky loser first. But I'd expect her to do that. And I don't think Elena Rabakina will be relishing that challenge in the second round, I would suggest. Um, also on sense today, as well as Roger, as well as Rebecca, was Andy Murray, who came through against Ryan Penniston. Incredibly, only the second time in his career that Andy Murray has faced a fellow Brit at any Grand Slam in the singles. He um, he played Liam Brody at Wimbledon in 2016 in the first round, and... Um, Actually, we asked Liam about this the other day, and he said he had a pretty bad day. Didn't play very well, and he made a bit of a monkey of him. And I would suggest that Ryan Penniston was pretty heavily beaten here as well. He only won four games. He was getting the sympathetic cheers when he picked up a game in the third set, having not won one for, I think, 11 games in a row. Um, if Penniston was to have any chance in this match, it was to surprise Murray and Murray has hit with him a lot, and therefore the element of surprise simply wasn't there. And someone, uh, people maybe don't know this, but at Wimbledon there are a lot of journalists who don't cover tennis necessarily regularly, but still lots of British journalists who are good good sports and news journalists. And someone says to me, Murray, what do you make of it? And I said, he's just a much better tennis player. And I stand by that. He, you know, I like Rowan Penniston. He's a very hard worker. He's got a decent game, he plays well on the grass, but, you know, Murray is just a much better player. And I think the same could be said of Arena Sabalenka and Pana Udvardi. Um, the scoreline was pretty one-sided, four games, Sabalenka lost. She looked imperious, to be honest. Um, and yeah, I think she's going to be a real threat in the draw. She's a, She's been to semi-finals here. She's a much stronger player mentally than she was when she got to the semis and frankly collapsed. Um, I think she's got a huge chance and, you know, starting fast like that is going to send it. I think a few shockwaves, you know, through those in the draw who might be wondering whether they might run into her uh, in the latter rounds. Rebecca, of course, is her potential semi-final opponent. Um, and while I don't think she should look anywhere beyond her second round, um, she may have half an eye on Sabalenka's form um, and rightly so. Uh, other results we got in today, Carlos Alcaraz beat Jeremy Shardy, uh, an incredibly straightforward um, match, 6-love, 6-2, 7-5. Ons Jabour beat Magdalena Fresh, uh, which was I think was a potential banana skin, but 6-3, 6-3. Um, I did kind of want to draw attention to what Jabour said after the match, which actually someone had to point out to me in the bar afterwards where I um, went to relax and um, see Mr. Belshaw, who isn't on this podcast because he was very relaxed indeed. Um, she was asked about Saudi Arabia, and she said it's a totally different situation for, than golf. If it benefits for the player, I'm 100% there. I hope in Saudi they will invest not just in the ATP, but with the WTA as well. 
I believe in Saudi, they're doing great, giving women more rights. It's time to change things. I went to Saudi last year and I was very impressed. I was very impressed with the people there. I believe it could be a great idea to go there and play tournaments. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess people we're pretty clear about our views on this stuff. Uh, not this stuff, on this particular issue. Um, I think I'm all for going to places and, you know, moderating and um, trying to make changes and improve people's situations. I don't know if taking a tennis tournament to a country where, you know, workers' rights, freedom of speech don't really exist. Um, I don't know if taking some tennis tournaments and you know paying a couple of hundred tennis players in the world much better is going to change those attitudes sorry ons i like you i often agree with you but i don't agree with you here uh and one more tennis result uh in terms of complete matches today cam nori beating thomas mahatch in four sets um which i don't think was a huge surprise um, I think most people thought Nori would win. I certainly thought he would win in four sets, which is why I said that in our prediction game and picked up a full three points for it, which I very much needed because uh, George and Calvin are rather streaking away with things, um, George in particular, and that brings me up to within touching distance of George. Um, not literally, thank God. Uh, the two other matches which were finished today were Thomas Martin Echeverri, who beat Bernabe Zapata Morales uh, in five sets, from two sets down, I should say, as well. Uh, but the one that maybe uh, we're a bit more concerned with is Dan Evans, who lost the first two sets to Quentin Alice on number two court on Monday evening. He was then rescheduled and pushed back and eventually moved on to centre court in the closing couple of hours, uh, an extra bonus match for the Centre Court fans, including George and his good friend uh, Jake, who I was calling Dan for a significant chunk of the day, uh, even having just been introduced to him. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, pretty pretty awful result from Dan. He, he's now lost 10 first-round matches. I think maybe even 11 first-round matches this year. Certainly in double figures. it It's pretty astonishing. What's crazy is in the six months of this year in which he has lost all those first round matches, he he's only dropped three places in the rankings. He, he's managed to maintain his ranking. Um, he said that tennis wasn't going to be on his agenda for a, a bit of a few days, probably maybe a week, um, before he got back at it and started thinking about the American hardcore season. I don't blame him. It's been, you know, it's always a very full-on part of the year for Dan. He obviously likes playing on the grass. I think he puts a reasonable amount of pressure on himself to succeed. And, uh, and yeah, he, he obviously is at home and, and would like to play well in front of in front of British fans. The opportunity isn't there very often. Um, you know, it's pretty much just a six-week or even less than that, four-week chunk of the year, and that's it. So, yeah, he was pretty gutted, and, and I understand that. And, uh, well, I hope, you know... I've always liked Dan Evans. Really, he's a, he talks well. He he gives people the time of day. He, he's honest. He doesn't bullshit. I know Calvin's known him for much longer than I have, and would say many similar things. Um, so I hope he rediscovers a bit of his his form because he's a fun tennis player to watch. Um, just looking briefly ahead to Wednesday, uh, we've got. Uh, a few quite interesting matches. Jody Burridge is going to be on centre court. In total, by the way, we've got 87 matches scheduled for Wednesday, uh, all of which are singles. They've had to push the doubles back because we are so far behind now. 67 matches in total cancelled on Tuesday. Um, my pick of the day is, well, there's a couple. Jordan Thompson is now at Djokovic on centre. I think Thompson can potentially give him a little bit of a run for his money. Sinner against Schwartzman on number one might be quite fun. Obviously, Schwartzman playing all right on grass, um, quite surprisingly, and a bit of a scrapper, and Sinner a little bit one-dimensional at times. Uh, upset chance on number two, Marta Kostrick up against Maria Sakari. Uh, similarly, Dominic Team has a set lead over Stefano Tsitsipas. Keep an eye on that one. Uh, Francis TFO against Wu Yibing, the Chinese player, on uh, number three court from 11am. That'll be a lot of fun, I suspect. Similarly, Runa and Lofhagen 
who follow it. Uh, yeah, there's just there's tennis everywhere. <laughs> you know, I don't recommend people get in the queue because the queue sounds like an absolute shit show this year and it's taking people seven hours to get in. But um, if there was a day to queue, you know, tomorrow would potentially be it. Uh, Wednesday, the 5th of July. So um, maybe that's the one to do. Anyway, that's quite enough from me. Uh, you got Danny Rogers uh, and me, unfortunately. Um, though less of me, I hope. Coming up next, uh, let's talk all about the brand Wimbledon. Now, a few weeks ago, we got a question from Matt D'Souza, who was asking about Wimbledon and their marketing expertise. Uh, and I thought there really was only one man to ask about that. I've got with me today Danny Rogers, who is editor of PR Week, a columnist for my own eye newspaper, uh, a very experienced media and marketing journalist, and also, I'm delighted to say, a listener to the show. Thanks for coming on, Danny. Nice to see you, James. Yeah, for people who don't know, Danny and I meet up about once every six months, uh, or try to anyway, and have a beer and uh, shoot the uh, shoot the shit, as they say. But uh, I thought I'd rely on some of his uh, more broadcastable views for today's uh, podcast. Um, Danny, you're obviously extremely experienced in the world of marketing and PR, which I guess is the other side of the coin from from what I do. When you look at something like Wimbledon, what would you say is the kind of the the USP? What what have they created that is quite so valuable to to advertisers and to themselves? I mean, brand Wimbledon is a huge success. It's it's almost uh, unrivaled in the sporting world as an event. Uh, the only other event I can think of that's got the sort of prestige and unique atmosphere of Wimbledon is probably the Masters golf, mm. Mm. Uh, in that it's a, a, a private club and it's got this sort of beautifully uh, curated manicured image and that's essential to Wimbledon the brand I think this this idea of this uh, almost English garden party that happens every summer and um, global audiences really buy into this it's not not just the Brits uh, the Americans the Germans the uh, the Indians you know they love this brand Wimbledon everything in white um, you know, beautiful etiquette. Uh, it's a, it's a great premium brand in that sense. And I suppose in that way, it's kind of it's brand Britain, isn't it? Sort of distilled down. Very much so. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I was at Glastonbury uh, last weekend, and um, it strikes me that these these brands are sort of representative of of Britain in different ways. You know, mm. um, Glastonbury's sort of representative of modern Britain. And it strikes me that Wimbledon's almost representative of the Britain that perhaps was around 100, 150 years ago. Yeah. And, and do you think that's still, I mean, we talk a lot about Brexit and Britain and, the, you know, Britain not having the same prestige on the global stage. Do you think in a in a sort of branding environment, actually Britain still does have that or is that beginning to fade? No, I think it does. And I think Wimbledon's an example of you know, where the Brits do sport very, very well. Mm. Um, it's still seen as the most prestigious uh, tennis event, I believe. I don't know if you would agree with that, but mm. it, it seems to be the one that gets the biggest global audience. And um, it's its Britishness that is essential to, to that success, as far as I can tell. The weird thing is we're not very good at tennis. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Andy Murray aside, we've barely uh, barely won the thing, and well, post war, barely won the thing at all. Um, I, I suppose what's interesting is, uh, and this kind of comes back to the the question um, that that Matt sent in, uh, is that Wimbledon is not somewhere that feels over advertised. You know, it's not. I, I know when people watch American sports, they say, "Oh, everything's got a sponsor," and yes, it does. You know, the Visa halftime show or the Subway takeaway in the middle of the second quarter. Um, and I just, I, I'll read you Matt's question so we know where we are. He, he said, "When you watch Roland Garros with sponsorship signs on the net and the same on the umpire's chair and other tournaments and naming rights on their arenas." Why do you think Wimbledon is not exploiting all their opportunities? I've thought for a while it must be to do with not wanting to damage the brand. Would the commercial value of Wimbledon be tarnished if they took on these obvious sponsorships? Yes, I think it would be tarnished. And, that, and that's the key question here. I think Wimbledon's approach to sponsorship is, is very cautious in that it wants to create this clean, uh, in inverted commas, uh, environment. So the all white um, rule of course is famous but also the logos of sponsors are very low profile 
they're either in black or in white everywhere you'll see in the um around the arena and it's because they want to keep it prestigious and actually it's very effective in raising sponsorship money and building the brand that that approach i mean they could probably i, th I believe the us open for example brings in about 50 percent more sponsorship revenue than wimbledon does right but wimbledon um generates about 30 or 40 percent more in terms of broadcast rights and this is this is a crucial calculation because if they raise more money from sponsorship by slapping logos everywhere they feel they will tarnish the overall brand that is they're selling via broadcast mm -hmm. um but i mean they still raise a lot of money in sponsorships so okay that's not as much as the us open but for example barclays this year you may have read is um a new sort of headline sponsor of um, wimbledon and indeed Barclays logo will replace Robinson's logo on the umpire's chair, which is a fairly uh, iconic um, sponsorship slot because every time the players, you know, change over at, uh, between games, they, you see that when they sit down. Um, and Barclays is believed to have invested something like 20 to 30 million a year in this particular sponsorship. Mm. And it's not just that particular logo they get for their 20 million. They're also doing a lot of hospitality. So for Barclays, they could invite top customers from around the world. Nobody turns down a Wimbledon ticket. So <laughs> right. you know, in terms of hospitality power to um, Barclays, that's, um, that's very powerful. So, you know, Wimbledon could splash more logos on, but it would damage the brand. And the fact is that underneath that clean image, there's actually a lot of very lucrative sponsorship going on in terms of hospitality and so on. Mm, it's interesting. Yeah, I suppose I, you mentioned the Robinsons thing, and I've just Googled it, and I, I, I couldn't have told you, if you had said to me without looking where the Robinsons logo is on the umpire's chair, I couldn't have told you. And now that I've seen it, you know, I'm like, well, of course, it's always there, and it makes perfect sense, but it is quite cleverly sort of pervasive. Um, I just want to ask you about that that kind of split between TV revenue and sponsorship. Well, which of those is more fickle? Because I feel like, you know, we're in a recession now. We were in a recession 15 years ago, and those kind of figures... M my instinct is that sponsorship is more fickle, but I don't know whether that's more true. Yes, yeah, sponsorship is certainly more fickle. And, and this is another interesting point in that, you know... Wimbledon's approach to sponsorship is very long term and and quite conservative and it makes it less fickle. Mm. So you'll see a lot of the partners that um, Wimbledon has have been around for many, many years. Yeah. Uh, but Barclays is the exception because it's replaced HSBC, which I believe has had it for the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years or so. Mm. But other brands like um, Babolat and Jaguar Land Rover and Rolex, um, Sip Smith Gin. Uh, they've been around for Evian. They've been around for many years. So sponsorship can be very fickle, but Wimbledon is very careful in making sure that it isn't, which saves it a lot of hassle, I guess. Mm. And uh, yeah, much less renegotiation and um, it creates a bit more resilience in the system, I suppose. Um... Those, those. I mean, the type of sponsors is obvious, isn't it? Like, it's kind of clear what the the level of brand is. But has that always been the case? Has it has it always been something that has pretty much used its, you know, tried to match its sponsorship deals with its with its kind of um, cachet? Yeah, very much so. That's that's very much part of brand Wimbledon is to only uh, get in sponsors who enhance that that premium. Um, sense of, of Wimbledon. I mean, another one, of course, is Ralph Lauren, which um, sponsors the, um, the ball boys and ball girls uh, outfits. Um, and I believe the, possibly even the umpires as well. Um, well, crucially, the line judges, because, of course, Wimbledon are refusing to get rid of line judges. And they say, it's quite interesting, actually, their, their, public, uh, their public message is that, well, we, we like the drama of challenges and you know, it creates something different about Wimbledon. But the reality is, uh, Polo Ralph Lauren pay an awful lot of money and umpires are very, very, you know, the line judges are very visible. They're in every shot. 
and they wear very distinctive outfits. And I, I guess that's why it's such a valuable deal to, to PLR. Yes, probably. I mean, whether or not they'll have to cave into uh, line technology sooner or later, I don't know. But um, again, you know, the fact that they're standing, there's people standing around very professionally judging things, again, is it's sort of brand Wimbledon again. Isn't it? Mm. It's, um, <laughs> it, it adds something to the spectacle, particularly the traditional spectacle of the uh, the event. Uh, you obviously wrote a column, um, I think, for your your own brand for campaign, um, talking about the the US audience, and it was actually uh, alluding to this thing that I've I've seen pushed in. Is it in Brooklyn, I think, um, or in Queens? Uh, are they calling it Wimbledon on the Hill? Uh, yeah, it's actually in Brooklyn, and okay. I think it's called um, the Hill Brooklyn. And oh, there of you course, go. it's it, it, it's really interesting because what they're trying to do to grow the brand of Wimbledon and grow their commercial revenue. Obviously they can't, well, I mean, they are trying to grow the Wimbledon site in the long term, but it's difficult to grow the event itself. Mm. But what you can do is sort of take the brand into new markets in different ways. So what they're doing is they're recreating Henman Hill uh, just under Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> and they're, uh, they're putting a huge screen up and it's all sort of branded, you know, that classic, uh, green and purple, uh, all England club colours. And uh, the American audience can go to this um, rather nice site in, um, in Brooklyn and they can watch uh, the big matches. And all the sponsors, well, some of the sponsors are there as well. So you'd be able to get Sipsmith Gin and you'd be able to, maybe you can get sold a Rolex watch, no, it's in New York. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, Ralph Lauren will have a, a, a merchandise stand or something. So it's a way of developing the U.S. market um, by creating this in, in the marketing world. We call it experiential marketing, you know, by creating yeah. a, another physical event and um, talking to the All England Club. They're planning to build on this and possibly take it to Los Angeles in the future, maybe wow. even, you know, Mumbai eventually. And um, <laughs> they, they identify certain markets around the world where they feel there is growth for the for the Wimbledon brand, particularly among a younger audience. Yeah. And those tend to be countries like America and, um, and India and Germany, which have strong tennis traditions where the um, where brand Wimbledon has a lot of resonance. Hmm. It's interesting, India, it's not really a market we ever talk about, I guess, because there aren't really many really high profile Indian players. Um, you know, it's, I'm actually supposed to be interviewing Sanya Mirza, who's obviously a long, long time doubles player, just retired. And she's working with the BBC this year on the Wimbledon coverage. And I thought that was an interesting move. And, and maybe, you know, I know the All England have a lot of input into the broadcast team. I wonder whether maybe there's a little bit of a shift, you know, to try and appeal to that a bit more in, in the TV product as well. Yeah, I think so. I think I think Asia generally is a big target simply because it's such a massive market. Uh, there's a lot of young people, and this is this is one of the problems that Wimbledon has as a brand, is that of course it's got this amazing prestige resonance for people of a certain age, but if it's going to carry on being successful in in decades time, they need to make it feel relevant to younger a younger more diverse audience, mm. um, and by doing that you've got you've got to innovate. You know you can't just um, do the same things that you were doing. Uh, 10, 20 years ago, you've got, you've got to try and make it feel relevant to different cultures, which mm. I, th I think you're right. Um, you've obviously been, uh, you were talking about um, the Hill in Brooklyn and you've obviously been to the US Open. We were both there last year. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is interesting how little of the US Open is about tennis. Like the people who go, look, they love tennis, but they don't really know about it. And I spoke to so many people who were like, oh, yeah, we've got Ash tickets. And I was like, who's playing? And they're like, oh, I'm not sure. Because it doesn't matter. It is about that experience, the cocktails, the, the fun, the crowd. It, it does seem like, and I know tennis fans won't like hearing this, but so many of these tennis events, the tennis is secondary or even tertiary. Yes. Yeah, I think that's right. And I mean, could we even say that about Wimbledon as well? Possibly. I mean, I think people people will buy tickets to Wimbledon even if they're not possibly tennis fans I don't know yeah. if that's fair but it just no I would agree with that yeah it's um it's, 
it's a bit like Glastonbury, isn't it? It's like people <laughs> buy, again, people buy the tickets without knowing who's actually playing. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Simply, yeah. simply because the event itself takes on such such power and prestige that people mm. just want to be part of it. Um, but I do think the the Wimbledon audience generally, I don't know if you agree, it does feel more knowledgeable about tennis and more passionate about tennis than the US Open in that most people you see wandering around at Wimbledon will sort of be checking the, the scoreboards and chatting about who they're going to see. I, I, I know there's that, there is that sort of hospitality element, which is, we've talked about, which is quite powerful, but I still feel like the British for two weeks of the year, at least become big tennis aficionados. Oh yeah, I, I, I think so. And, and because it's on the BBC, it's easy to access. It makes a massive difference. Um, we're running out of time, Danny, but I, I should at least talk to you about tennis in some way. You're a, you're a keen player and watcher. W- which days are you going to Wimbledon this year? You, do you know yet? Uh, I think I'm going the first Tuesday and the second Wednesday. Ah, so um, I'm hoping that um, some some top players are still in, uh, <laughs> in, in, in the second week. Um, I haven't got much hope that Mr. Murray will still be in on the second week, but um, you might you get know, him on the first Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, the first. I'm looking. I love the first week at Wimbledon particularly because obviously you see more players and everybody's still in there. It's still the first round, so. Uh, I can't wait. Yeah, I always say to people, because you, there is a thing, you can go after five o'clock and get into the grounds for about a tenner and there's never really a queue at that time. And uh, in the first week, you can still get some amazing players on you know, court seven and just, just wandering around. So yeah, I, I'm with you the first week. It, it's absolutely manic from a work perspective, but it is yeah. a, it's a special time. Some, something I would say this year, they, they seem to be promoting Wimbledon harder Interesting. Uh, the, the BBC and the media generally, I don't know if you've noticed this, but it, it seems to be more interest around Wimbledon than, say, last year. I'm not, I'm not sure why that is. Mm. Um, I, th- but- I think last year there was still a little bit of reticence around big events. I, maybe as young people, I don't think we necessarily noticed it, but I do know people who went to Wimbledon last year and said, oh, oh, it was a bit odd being in a really big crowd and just a little bit of reticence, you know, coming up off the back of COVID. And I wonder whether maybe that translated into the marketing as well. And they said, look, we, we still, we're we aware we're still in this kind of post-war period and they didn't want to be. And and I think the, the Russia stuff as well really, really impacted how hard they could push it because they knew, you know, every time you scratch at it, you create more blowback and, you know, this year, I mean, I know there's blow, there's blowback, whatever decision you make now, but um, it seems like I think they're a bit less maybe ashamed of what they're doing, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it feels less controversial this year, Wimbledon, doesn't it? It feels a bit more on track, like you say, after the pandemic years and then we had the, uh, the Russian-Ukraine problem, uh, although that's still there. It, it feels more like a normal year, I think, and perhaps that's what we're going to see. Yeah, exactly. Well, Danny, thank you so much for uh, joining me. Uh, you're off to another um, prestigious venue today in Lords to, to watch it rain and then maybe Australia score some runs, but I'm sure we'll have you back on again at some point. I'd love that. Thanks very Thanks. much, James. Cheers. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Podcast Network.